Hi guys, we are moving on in chapter two today to some new network protocols. Um, and these are somewhat old. Um, so you'll see kind of how <laughs> protocols were originally designed, but they are also still used in the internet uh, pretty much without change. Um, so they remain relevant. Um, I think the main point of this lecture is to kind of tell you how some of the protocols are built um, that they are still uh, in place and this just give you a spectrum of how protocols can be designed. Okay, It's kind of more important to remember the principles behind these protocols than kind of the details of their operations and certainly we won't be going to the level of looking at the um, packet formats in very much detail. All right, without further ado. Uh, first we have the file transfer protocol which was designed to move um, basically transfer files between two different um, computer nodes. This is part of the research, kind of transferring research data in early internet. And so what's cool about this protocol is that it actually maintains two different connections. So you have the control connection between a client and a server over port 21, this is using TCP, and you have data transfers over port 20. So both of these ports would have to be open in the firewall. Right, um, and so this is different from HTTP, where HTTP communicates everything kind of in band, meaning over a single connection. There's only a single band, but in FTP, the control communication is out of band or basically using a different channel. Now, why would we want this separate connection? Um, can think about that for a second, but the reason is that. In HTTP, everything goes over a single connection. So when you have a large data transfer and you want to send some control information, for example, I don't know, a new command, that new command will be stuck behind all the data that is queued up on the TCP connection. Um, and so the server would be able to receive it until all the data transfer is done, right? Um, kind of the control messages have to take a back seat in the queue to the data transfers, right? So for example, you can think of a scenario where you're transferring a lot of data and then you want to send a cancel message and that cancel message doesn't actually get through until all the data in front of it gets transferred. Okay, so HTTP 2.0 solves that um, to a degree. Uh, we talked about that already, but kind of the original solution to this was basically to have a separate control connection that has a separate queue than the data connection. The other difference between FTP and HTTP is that in HTTP the server doesn't maintain any per client state, um, whereas in FTP it does, right? So this FTP server will maintain some authentication information about the user, basically that the user is authenticated, um, and it will also re keep some information about the user's state of operations, for example, what directory the client is in right now in the file structure of the server. Okay, um, so here's a procedure of how FTP works. There's a connection on port uh, 21. There's an authorization um, kind of built into this protocol as well. There's not one in um, HTTP. The authentication HTTP is on top. We'll kind of talk about this when we get into security. Um, so the client can browse remote directory, send commands, all this stuff happens over the control channel in port 21. Um, and then when there is a request for file transfer, there is a separate connection created just for that file and then it closes after that um, connection. Uh, let me close the door here for there we go, a little less sound. Okay. Um, so that's basically FTP. All right. The next protocol I'm going to talk about is SMTP or Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. So mail was kind of the first killer app of the internet. I don't think anyone uses that term anymore, but it was big in the 90s or early 2000s, I guess, as well. All right. So what SMTP does is basically support email communication. 
Um, and the procedure goes as follows. Let's say that Alice wants to send an email to Bob. Well, the email doesn't go directly between Alice's computer and Bob's computer. In fact, what happens is that Alice, the person, contacts the agent, which is the email program on her device, and then the agent sends the email to an SMTP server that on which Alice has an account. This, this SMTP server then forwards the email to another SMTP server on which Bob has the account, right? So if Alice is at gmail.com, then this would be a Gmail server. And if Bob is at outlook.com, this would be a Microsoft server. And then Bob's agent checks the SMTP server for any new messages for Bob. And if there is one, then Bob gets a notification, right? So that's the procedure. Um, so that, it goes through two different servers that end up performing some of the actions. Okay. So what these two servers enable is basically asynchronous communication. So in HTTP, you can connect to a server, but the server has to be online at the same time. Whereas with email, it is convenient to be able to send an email to Bob, even though Bob is not around because Bob can get that email later. Okay, and then there's kind of different protocols for getting data um, from the server by the agent, which could be either using POP3 or IMAP. Okay, um, these are not terribly important. Um, they're part of it, but for, for retrieving data, you use POP3 or, or IMAP. For uh, sending data, you use SMTP. Okay, so some other differences with HTTP is that SMTP is a much older protocol and it is even more verbose if that's possible. So I used to have a, a demo that would show you guys this live. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for some changes to security, um, but maybe we can get it working again. But what happens basically is that you can telnet on port 25, which is the unsecured port for SMTP communications into cs.montana.edu. And from there, we used to be able to basically start typing where the mail is from me to me. Um, and then to actually compose the message, you would have a, a, an extra, a line here. You would say data. And then you could have the subject heading. And the subject would be basically hello. And then I could do another space and then start typing the message. And then to finish, I would do a period on its own line and then do another enter and the message would be sent. And I was able to show that this <laughs> mail actually got through. So you could sort of type in messages by hand this way without using a particular mail client. And what this action does is actually just connects you to your SMTP server. Okay. Um, the other difference is that SMTP is a push protocol where data gets sort of push to the destination rather than a pull protocol where um, Bob basically pulls data from Alice's server. Um, right, that's not how it happens. Alice's server pushes data to Bob's server. Okay, so now you might be wondering why are we doing this with the two different servers, All right? So the whole idea is to have um, this communication be asynchronous such that Alice can send messages emails to Bob without Bob being online, right? So you could ask, well, um, why not send message, messages directly between clients, okay? So Alice wants to send email to Bob, sends it through the email app on her phone, and then that appears in the email app on Bob's phone. Well, the reason is that Bob's phone may not have an internet connection at the time, right? And so that would make this communication synchronous and we would like it to be asynchronous, right? So why not just send a message, okay, from Alice's agent to Bob's server directly, right? This could be done, but then um, you don't know if Bob's server is online. You don't know if there's an internet connection. This agent would have to keep retrying the sends into Bob's server, potentially waiting for it to come back online. Um, this is not crazy these days, right? These phones stay around, they could do this. Um, but in the early days when you had terminals, the terminals were dumb. Um, that couldn't basically work like that, um, right? So what we want is to um, 
Alice to be able to use her agent to commit the email to her server. And then the server is stable. It can kind of keep waiting for Bob's server to come online. Alice can go and do something else, can log out, but Alice's server will keep trying to send the email to Bob's server. That makes this asynchronous from Alice and Bob's perspective. Okay. And so then you can ask, well, how is this really different from online social networks? Is there a difference? Um, you could send an email to multiple recipients. So that's sort of a social network-like feature. Um, what's the difference? You can kind of pause the video and think about it. Um, actually, you know what? This is a good enough question. I think I'm going to uh, recommend that somebody ask this or that you guys address this on our discussion group. How is email, in fact, different from online social networks? Is there a difference? Okay. So the final system I want to talk about today is DNS, which is um, one of the key enablers of mobile web. So it's not just the internet of sending data between computers, but actually enables us to treat internet as a web in many ways that kind of have become synonymous. Okay. So the problem in DNS solves, or the main name system solves, is the mapping between mnemonics, which is what people like, things like Montana.edu, okay, we can remember that pretty easily, to things that routers like, which are fixed length addresses, or IP addresses, or really just 32-bit um, numbers. Well, when we talk about the network layer, we'll see how these convert. Okay, so for routing, we want fixed bit numbers, uh, fixed length numbers for people to remember things we like mnemonics. So we need to map between the two. Um, and there's actually more to it. It's not that people like them. This mnemonic can be more stable. We can always have the service underneath this address, but the actual server can change IPs. And that's kind of really the convenience of it. It's not just a mnemonic, it's not that we can't remember numbers, it's that this is a stable address and the address of the actual node should be able to change. For example, when a server fails and we need to use another server. Okay, so what the domain name system is, is a mapping between host mnemonics and IP addresses. Okay? So for example, you want to send some message to montana.edu Okay, that's a server that sits somewhere, but you don't know its IP address. So your client will contact the local DNS server in your network, in your ISP's network. And that DNS will do the lookup to tell you that the IP address is 153.90.3.95. And now your client will be able to send IP packets to that address. Okay. Um, so that's the um, kind of... Uh, communicating with DNS to resolve names and then something to remember that lookups to DNS are done over UDP on port 53. Okay, so there are these special ports like um, USMP uses uh, 25 for unsecured communications, 587 for secure, I think. Um, DNS uses port 53, right? And you'll notice that all these ports are below port 1024. So kind of the these sort of low port numbers have been historically reserved for particular protocols, which makes it easy for um, firewalls to open just those ports to allow just those protocols to function. Okay, so a little demo for you guys. Uh, what we need is this. Yes, okay. So to look up something in DNS, you can basically issue the request on your own and say, uh, host and let's say montana.edu kind of gives you a nice output here it shows you both the mail and web address I'll talk about that more in a second but if you want just the web address you can say host um, type I think that's gonna work hey montana.edu okay that just gives you the web addresses or if you want to get the IPv6 address you can do quad a and you get nothing, because unfortunately we don't have IPv6 addresses in our network, shameful. Um, but you could do, do something like this, I hope, for google.com. 
guess, and you get an IPv6 address. Um, you can also do, instead of host, you can use dig. Um, and that just gives you, it's kind of another program to issue DNS requests. That gives you a little bit more information out of the bat, but you can both control host and dig to give you whatever you want. For example, run man host, and that will give you all the different options you can use. I'll show you some cool things a little bit later on. Okay, back to our thing. So, if you think about how DNS could be built, um, it's actually not just one server, right? You need a lot more servers because you need to be able to look up any possible um, web address and translate it to an IP address. So um, this would be a good time to pause the video and think about how the DNS system could be actually built and implemented. And here's how this works. So you can think of the DNS system as a distributed database where in fact no server has all the records um, and the organization of DNS servers is hierarchical. So at the top level you can think of the root DNS servers okay, which basically just know of TLD servers. Okay? They just have the records or the mappings to different TLD servers. So the TLD servers are responsible in turn for groups of domains that fall under .com, .org, .net, .edu, etc. There's also TLD servers for different country domains. Um, and so um, that's when you can look up on those TLD servers, you can look up, um, for example, on a .com server, you can look up the DNS server for yahoo.com. Now, what the TLD server has is the IP address of the authoritative DNS server. Okay, this would be a DNS server in someone's organization, which would have then the mapping between yahoo.com and, um, and a particular IP. Okay, so local DNS servers. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so you'd have, the, you'd have the mapping to the authoritative DNS server, um, which would have the mapping for between the um, IP, between the, so let's say, yahoo.com and the IP of that server, okay? Then you have local DNS servers, which are basically the servers you use to look up IP addresses. Those are the servers that implement the communication with all these other servers, okay? They act as a proxy and, in fact, may contain cache records to avoid some of the lookups. Um, I'll show you guys how that works in a second. But, the idea behind this design is that instead of having some one giant server that contains all the DNS uh, mappings, we have a network of servers. Each of them does some portion of the work. And in fact, it pushes the complexity of this to the edge, to servers in um, each organization, for example, for Yahoo, for Amazon, for PBS, etc., etc. Right? So these servers will do very little of the work and most of the records and most of the work is done at the edge of the network, which is a well to, a, to scale uh, network performance instead of trying to centralize it, which will become a central point of failure and a bottleneck for performance. Okay, so if you look at all the um, root DNS servers, they would be here, whereas you have the, all the TLD servers, kind of there's that many, this is a couple years old, but you can see that root servers are um, very, very few. Okay. Um, actually, maybe, yeah, let's just, let's do this. Okay. So we'll come back to kind of the structure and the process of DNS lookup, but I want to show you guys another demo of things you can do with DNS. So we already talked about just looking up montana.edu. Okay, and in fact, we get the web addresses and we also get the mail server, right? So if you want to send mail to someone at Montana.edu, you would actually contact this server. Right now, this is still a mnemonic. Here we get IP addresses and here we just get a mnemonic. So what we can do is copy this and say host just that. Okay, 
and then that will actually give you the IP address of the web server of the SMTP server for the university. Okay. Um, you can also look this up directly by saying type MX or mail exchange for Montana DDU. Uh, great, and then you get the same thing. Okay, so you can also get a canonical name for a particular server. So let's say that we want to do, <clears throat> we want to look up a server, get its canonical name for image that Huffington Post. Okay, so if you look at kind of web traffic, you can see that a lot of the images are being for, let's say, Huffington Post or any other news site or whatever, are actually served from image.huffingtonpost.com. Okay, so when you look up the canonical name for that, you'll see that it's actually not image.huffingtonpost.com, but it is CS that blah, 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 which is on some content distribution network um, out there. Okay, so this is actually a third party server that hosts images for this particular website, which you can then likewise look up as to where this thing sits. Okay, and as you can see, it has both IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. Okay, you can also do this. Um, oh, okay, so I guess we can do, I can show you guys also load distribution. So if you look at, let's say, halfpost.com, okay, you can see that we get um, these different addresses. Okay, so I can also look at, um, let's say we just isolate to type A addresses. Okay, so those are the web addresses. So every time I make this request, you can see that the list rotates by one. Okay, uh, sort of the one, 115.100 seems to be at the top, but there is, is there rotation? There was here, see, this is different from that. Okay, so it's periodically kind of rotating depending on actually how many other people make requests to this. Um, so every time we make a request, the DNS returns to us this list in different order, okay? So as different clients make these requests, they get a different address that they will choose from this list. They, the computer will generally um, just pick the first one. And so by rotating this list, um, the DNS is actually load balancing requests to the server to the different servers that are mapped to the same domain. Okay, so it's a very simple mechanism for um, um, distributing the load among available servers that serve the content for the same domain. Okay. The final thing we can do that I want to show you is to look is to look up a host using different DNS servers. So if we do something like this, where we host for google.com, um, maybe I'll just do a .a again, or type a. Okay, so we get this IP address. All right, and you can see that it kind of gives us two different addresses, right? But what we can also do is we can look up that address using 8.8.8.8, okay? So now we're gonna say, let's look up host, uh, let's look up google.com through another DNS server, okay? So instead of using um, the DNS server of the university, we're gonna force our host into an open DNS server, which is actually also provided by Google. Right? And when we do this, you see that we're actually getting a very different IP address. Okay? So there is a set of IP addresses that can be served kind of close to our DNS server, and those are those. And if you go to a random DNS server somewhere else in the internet, that DNS server might not know what is necessarily the closest um, Google server to us and just give us some um, its best guess which you can see is in a different network than um, 
what we would get from our local DNS server. Okay, so let's look at um, what actually happens underneath in terms of creating DNS entries. Okay, and then let's look at how DNS lookups are actually made. Um, so let's say that we want to insert DNS records. So we decide to start a new website. It's called netutopia.com. Okay, and what we do is we contact the, the registrar for websites where we get our or you know network solutions or GoDaddy or whatever you're going to use, um, and basically get an IP from it for our um, authoritative DNS server. So in our network, we need to set up a few things. We need to set up the authoritative DNS server. We need to set up the web server from which we're going to serve the web content. And we need to set up the mail server in case we want to have email addresses at um, netutopia.com. OK, we contact the registrar. And the registrar enters into some TLD server, or specifically the TLD server for um, .com, because that's our website, the IP address of our authoritative DNS server. So now the TLD has a mapping between netutopia.com and the IP address of our ADNS server. Right? Notice, not our web server or mail server, but the DNS server that we host. Okay. So what the client does, it says, hey, I want to access netutopia.com. Maybe it already knows where the .com DNS server is, the, the TLD server for .com. There it looks up the IP of our authoritative DNS server. And then from there, the authoritative DNS server points the client to our um, web server. Okay, So the actual record in the .com TLD is netutopia.com maps to dns1.netutopia.com and that's a name server entry. Okay, And then it also has the entry between dns.netutopia.com to the actual IP address of our third DNS server and this is a type A entry giving an uh, IPv4 IP address. Okay. And then if you want to provide mappings between uh, netutopia.com and a web server and a mail server, you need to update the authoritative DNS server with type A and type MX records. Okay, so finally, let's look at the process of DNS lookup. There are kind of two methods that can be used for this. One is the iterative lookup, which is what is really used in practice today and one that used to be the recursive lookup, which has some advantages, but um, it is pretty much not used today very much. Okay, and there were some interesting research projects that took advantage of recursive lookup, and over the years, the, that research kind of becomes unreproducible because there just isn't that much support for recursive lookup anymore. So, in the iterative lookup, we want to look up uh, the IP address of gaia.cs.umass.edu. So the first request, the first query, goes to the LDNS server um, in poly.edu from where, where the host resides. Okay? That local DNS server will then contact the root server to get the TLD for that .edu um, addresses. Okay? Once the LDNS has the TLD uh, server IP, it contacts it for the ADNS for poly.edu. Okay, and then in step six, LDNS contacts the ADNS here and gets the mapping for cis.poly.edu. Okay. So first we get the TLD from the root, then we get the ADNS from the TLD, and then we ask the TLD for the mapping to the actual um, IP for the web address we're trying to look up. In the recursive lookup, this process goes as follows. We want to get to gaia.cs.umas.edu. We send the request to our LDNS. The LDNS forwards the request to the root server. The root server forwards this request to the TLD. The TLD forwards it to the ADNS. And then the reply goes back. Okay? So you can think of it, which method would actually be faster and why? 
I would suggest pause the video, discuss, think about it. Okay, so the advantages here are that, let's say we're con contacting a server in China, right? So now we're sending the message, the lookup to our local DNS, then maybe to some server, I don't know, somewhere else in the States, then this gets forwarded to a TLD in China, if it's a that .cn um, web address, and then to an authoritative DNS. So the message kind of follows the geography, right? And each of these links is relatively short, okay? So kind of we're traversing the space more efficiently. What happens here, on the other hand, is that the request goes to the TLD server, this pings and back to the root server, then it pings and backs to China, then it pings and backs to another server in China, right? So you have these long paths, continental paths being traversed, um, and that creates kind of longer transmission delays. The advantage though, or longer propagation delays, the advantage of this, or rather, the disadvantage of recursive lookup is that the root level servers need to do a lot of work. Right? Basically, every query ends up going through them, and so there's a lot of load that they need to handle. Whereas in this approach, the complexity is pushed to the edge, to the LDNS server in each organization, and they handle kind of the multiple steps of this process, um, leaving the root and the TLD to only handle one request um, and not have to kind of participate in this forward and back transmission of data, right? You can see that there's only kind of two arrows connecting to that uh, root server here and four arrows connected here. So obviously there's going to be more traffic, right? So for that reason to distribute the load to the edge, really the iterative lookup is the name of the game um, these days. Okay, so if however we needed to do either the iterative or recursive lookup all the time, this would take a long time and we would like to um, avoid that. So what the local DNS does in fact is cache a lot of the information um, between lookup processes. Um, okay, so <laughs> what happens is let's say we want to look up gaia.cs.umass.edu and someone already has done this from within our network the local DNS will basically have the mapping between Gaia.cs and its IP address and just return it to us, right? So none of this kind of iterative lookup has to happen, okay? What if Gaia.cs.umas.edu is a new uh, web address being looked up from the point of view of our organization, our local DNS might already have the IP address for the .edu TLD, okay? So it doesn't need to contact the root server, it already cached this information. Or maybe there already has been traffic to umas.edu and so our local DNS could also just have the IP of the authoritative DNS server already cached, okay? So kind of as these lookups come out, the local DNS will try to cache TLDs will try to cache authoritative DNS servers to avoid steps in this lookup. Um, and hopefully it can cache even the entry for um, particular IP address to speed up this lookup um, uh, for the local host. And in fact, the host can also have some DNS cache to even avoid contacting the local DNS. Now, the problem with caching is that you can't cache data forever. Data might change. Right? These servers might move to different IP addresses or Gaia might move to a different IP address. And so you can't kind of keep this information in the cache forever. Okay? So what authoritative servers can do, for example, is to send update requests. So let's say that Gaia.cs moves to a different IP. The authoritative DNS can then tell the TLD that, that Gaia.cs has moved. And so that's a way to update for the authoritative server to update the cache of the TLD. And um, um, so that's one mechanism. The other mechanism is that the entries that are cached at the local DNS server will only be cached for some amount of time and be refreshed periodically where the entry will time out and now the local DNS will go through the lookup process again. You can also force to get around the cache. So for example, let's say 
you have some entry cash for Montana.edu, but now you want to force um, lookup outside of the cache. What you can do is look up the name server, type name server for Montana.edu. Okay, and what we're gonna get is the DNS servers for Montana.edu, which is cool. And so now we can do a host, montana.edu, that's the web address we wanna look up. And now we wanna send the query to the, serve, to the actual DNS server, force it, basically to go to the authoritative DNS server. We can do this way, and now we get the authoritative query um, served. Okay. So, um, Anyway, so those are basically the things you can do with DNS. It's a pretty cool mechanism. It has been designed and kind of lived very much unchanged for all these decades, really. Um, there were some changes in terms of security, um, but that's about it. Um, it's well designed, it does what it needs to do, and I think it's gonna stick around for a long, long time. Um, if you have any questions about the discussion, um, please post on D2L. Uh, please come to the discussion on Wednesday. There weren't that many people, uh, but those that were got a lot of hints about what to do in the homework. And now hopefully you will ask for hints on what to do on your programming assignment. So please attend the Wednesday's meetings. And um, yeah, see you guys in a couple days. Thanks, bye.